it's my pleasure today to introduce our special guest for the day, Seymour Cray. And this is someone about whom it's hard to sort the legend from the fact. Uh, my favorite legend being that he has a crew of little elves in his backyard and he waves a magic wand and supercomputers appear somewhere. Uh, another one that's hardly, I don't know whether it's legend or fact, but it is after visiting, it is, it is rumored, after visiting his laboratory in Chippewa Falls, uh, a group of visiting Russians didn't know whether they thought it was just a front, the little place that was there. They couldn't believe that that was where the computers were actually built. They thought they were putting them on. But uh, finally, for what is presumably fact, uh, Seymour Cray graduated from the University of Minnesota and spent a few years with UNIVAC and left there to, with the group of people that founded Control Data Corporation in, I believe, about 1957, and was responsible there for design and construction and occasionally miscellaneous software for the 1604 and the 6600 and the 7600 computers and the design of the 8600 computer. Two years ago, he uh, left there to form his own company, Cray Research Incorporated, where he has been busily uh, designing and well underway and constructing his own Cray 1 computer. I think that's enough introduction. If you want me here, I'm, uh, I'm getting older. I can't help but pick up on that remark about the Russian visitors to Chippewa Falls because uh, that was a glorious day and, and ha had a great time. And, and what actually happened there uh, was at the last minute as the Russian visitors were leaving, uh, they invited me to Moscow to uh, visit their computing facility and uh, give a little talk. And uh, they asked me if I would do that. and. Uh, and I just smiled, and uh, <laughs> they, they looked puzzled, and uh, I, I didn't want to say no, and, and, uh, so I just smiled. And they said, <laughs> as they went out the door and I was shaking their hands outside, uh, they asked me again uh, if, I, if I would like to come and, and speak. And, and, uh, at the University of Moscow, and I smiled again. And, uh, and I heard uh, about a week later from Bill Norris, who was uh, the next person they, they saw. They went back to Minneapolis and uh, talked to Mr. Norris, and, and they said, when we were in Chippewa, we were talking to Seymour Cray, and we asked him to come, and he just smiled. And what did he mean by that? <laughs> and Bill Norris just smiled. <laughs> about physics uh, that I find interesting. Uh, and, and just uh, a little tidbit here and there. Uh, the background, uh, I guess you all know, uh, next year is my 25th year in the computer business, having started in 1950. And I just happened to start at Engineering Research Associates at the time we were building the 1103 computer. And that was one of those not the very earliest, but almost the very earliest vacuum tube machine. And it was really the first scientific machine in the sense that uh, the uh, predecessors were pretty special purpose. So I was very fortunate in having graduated from college at such a time that I could start right at the beginning of a whole new field. And so I have to be pretty thankful for that because uh, 
I'm not too old yet, and yet I'm, I'm a pioneer in this particular field. And the other thought that comes to mind right away is, uh, what am I doing here? I'm more surprised to be here than you are to see me, because I haven't talked to a large group for 10 years. Uh, and I'm in the woods working with my elves in Wisconsin. <laughs> understand what happened today, because uh, this is a very unusual event for me. Uh, there are, of course, if, uh, a lot of people that have come and gone through my little place, and uh, I do see a lot of them, but never a uh, group this large. So let me tell you uh, uh, a little bit, uh, a few of the problems uh, that uh, and the solutions that, that I see in, in building large computers. Uh, first of all, uh, as you probably all well know, I think that building large computers should be done with the fewest possible people. One is perfect, but you can't quite do it with one. So uh, the next best thing is about 12. <laughs> the reason you need 12 is you kind of need one person from each of the disciplines that are necessary. Uh, you need a mechanical engineer to build a box for you to put it in, and you need an electrical engineer to put the circuit together, and you need a little bit of logic here and there, and a programmer here and there, and uh, you need a secretary, of course, but not very many. And uh, throughout, uh, really, uh, my career, and there have been about six generations of machines that I've been through in three companies, so. ERA, Remington Rand, which is just the same, control data, and my own company. The number of people involved has been pretty much constant. It's varied from a low of 25 to a high of 40. And that's a group where I can remember everybody's name, and I think that's pretty important, and yet uh, large enough so that we can, in fact, uh, build, uh, really, the world's largest scientific computers and uh, have done so for several generations. Uh, my current company has 25 people. I uh, started two years ago, and I certainly wouldn't want any more. It's kind of crowded. And uh, the uh, uh, current machine is far enough along so that uh, it's starting to run programs, and we believe it sure enough is going to be uh, another machine that does the things it's supposed to do. So uh, the idea of, of a small group of people uh, is, is kind of an essential. And to the extent that I've been successful in building large machines, I think that is one key thing. Another key point uh, that's perhaps equally important is discipline. Now, uh, if you work in a large corporation, it's very hard to keep on one track for four or five years. And four or five years is what you have to keep on the track to finish any project like that. So continuity uh, is, uh, is another very, very important thing. And without uh, the continuity, uh, and I, I mean not only uh, the support of the uh, organization that's providing money for you, but also the continuity in the sense of people sticking around to finish the job. It's hard to design a computer if uh, the person that started it four years ago has left and he's been replaced twice by somebody else. Uh, so uh, another characteristic uh, is that uh, the people that I'm working with today, uh, my little elves, uh, are all kind of old little elves. They've all been around mostly since the early 50s or mid 50s. That is about half of them are. And that brings me to another important point, which I think you all appreciate, and really hit me hard this year. Because we decided that we were all getting too old, and something should be done. Uh, so uh, we decided that we would hire eight new people, fresh out of school, didn't know anything about computers. I don't know, a little bit of something about electronics, a little bit about physics, maybe. but. Uh, Let's, let's say three of them college graduates and three from trade schools. And we just sit them down and, and try to teach them about this huge complex computer that we're designing and see how far we'd get. Well, the shocking thing was it was only about three months and they were doing so well at it that they were telling me about my design and what was wrong with it. And by golly, they were right. <laughs> 
these, these new kids were, were finding flaws in my logic design that I wouldn't have found myself. And yet they had no experience prior to a few months of contact. And I, I guess one of the things was that they were so unimpressed. They had no idea, really, that this was supposed to be a big, powerful machine, and they were so unimpressed that, it, uh, of course, you know, uh, they, <laughs> they thought this was what everybody did that graduated from school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with an attitude like that, it's amazing. Uh, I guess maybe we are building simple computers. Anyway, I'm, I'm very impressed uh, with uh, what today's college graduates and trade school graduates can do in a very short period of time. It's just very impressive. I, I just don't believe I could have done that when I graduated. So something is, has improved in our education system, and uh, I'm all for it. Uh, there are, are several aspects to the uh, design of computers I'd like to just touch on. I don't want to bore you with a lot of statistics and details and characteristics. But well, let me just trace a bit the evolution uh, of the computers as I see them, uh, where, where I am right now. And I have to say it that way because I probably know less about what's going on in the computer business than any of you do. I've concentrated in such a, a narrow little area spend all my time off in the woods with my elves. I don't know what's going on in the world. That's one of the reasons I'm here, is I would kind of like to find out what's going on in the world. But uh, let that be as it may. That must make me an expert, I guess. I'm from far away, and uh, I don't know what's going on, and so I might as well, <laughs> I might as well tell you my little bit. <laughs> So I've been doing my little thing and not paying attention to anybody else, and maybe that has some merit. Anyway, uh, uh, my story really starts uh, with the beginning of controlled data. Uh, prior to that, I was really copying other people's work and, and learning the trade. Uh, but uh, beginning uh, with uh, controlled data, I began to develop confidence enough to do something on my own. And the first real thing I did on my own was a 6600 computer. And you know, I've been trying all day to think of when that was delivered, and I think that was delivered within 10 years of today. I think it was this week in December, in 1964, that that first machine was delivered here. Now, I wish I could think of the day, but I'm, I swear it can't be more than three or four days off. Anyway, that, that was the first time that I implemented my own ideas, ignoring all the advice that I was getting from everyone else in the world on what a computer should be. And that really went to my head, and I haven't recovered since. Um, <laughs> uh, there, were, there were two aspects of that machine that, that I thought uh, were worthy of note, uh, and I think they've both been noted. Uh, one of them was using peripheral processors in a very intimate way uh, to to do the I.O. functions of the machine. Uh, and that was a lot of fun, and uh, that was kind of a weird arrangement uh, in that particular machine, but it, it did do the, the job, and uh, it was the beginning of some new thinking. Uh, the other thing uh, was um, keeping the computational uh, sequences in a, in a microscopic sense away from the memory, providing uh, some intermediate registers which could be addressed with just a few bits, namely three, uh, to uh, designate the sources and destinations of operands. And that made uh, the uh, instructions uh, very simple. And uh, that uh, thought is still with me and is still very present in the machine that I'm designing now. And, and that, that is somewhat unique. Uh, most machines uh, have rather elaborate instruction sets uh, involving uh, more memory references in the instructions uh, than the machines that I've designed. So simplicity, I guess, is a way of saying it. I, I am all for simplicity. If it's very complicated, I can't understand it. And, and so uh, that, uh, that's got to be the way to go for me. Now, uh, there was a, a kind of a, a plateau in, uh, in the 6,000 and 7,000 machines in that uh, 7,600s, as many of you probably know, are very much like 6600s. It was a file-around machine that was 
pretty much compatible, same instruction set. Uh, I just took advantage of technology five years later and uh, was delivered here, I believe, in 1969, just five years after the first. Uh, and so, uh, gee, if we had five more years, it's time, it's time to come back. And, <laughs> and sure enough, here I am, and uh, I'm talking about uh, a delivering machine here next year, if you folks will only take it. And uh, here I am pedaling. Well, uh, there are a few aspects uh, of the current machine uh, that I can use as examples uh, of where I've been going, uh, and then I can uh, say a bit about where I think uh, I at least would go from here. Uh, the, uh, the basic uh, facts of life in uh, large computers uh, relate in several areas. One of them is, is the electrical properties of the machine. Uh, you know, there's something about the speed of light that's just hard to get around. And so uh, if you're going to build a fast machine, it's just got to be small. And so uh, throughout the sequence, uh, machine designs have physically gotten smaller and smaller. Uh, if you look at a 7600, uh, the volume of that machine, you know, it's kind of skinny. It's only a foot thick. Uh, the volume of that machine is quite a ways down from a, a 6600. And uh, the, the wire lengths involved are, are just a whole lot shorter. And I have a few slides, which I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes. And a uh, machine uh, that I'm designing in my Cray research company, which we're calling the Cray One computer, are ever so much smaller. They're smaller by a factor uh, of about five. And so, obviously, uh, the next one is going to be something I can bring with me and uh, show you there. <laughs> uh, and I have a little difficulty doing that yet, so fortunately I have a few years left. But uh, the physical dimension, I think, has just got uh, to be related to size. Uh, and and that's, that's one very important aspect. The, uh, uh, the speeds involved uh, in... Uh, in current machines, in the case uh, of the current machine, a 12 nanosecond clock period uh, is, uh, is not very long in terms of physical distances. Uh, actually, uh, the speed uh, of electrical uh, signal along a, uh, a foil run on a circuit board is about half the speed of light. So you only go about six inches in a nanosecond. So in 12 nanoseconds, you can go 72 inches, and that's only six feet. And uh, that's the whole clock period if you didn't do anything but just run around. <laughs> uh, so uh, every inch counts. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that's been a real challenge uh, is to uh, uh, design the machine so that it is compact as possible. And in all the machines that I've done, uh, cost has been very much a secondary consideration. We'll figure out how to build it as fast as possible, completely disregarding the cost of construction, and then take a look at the cost secondly. And almost never has there been much of a compromise on the basis of cost uh, as a second look. Now, uh, as you get uh, more and more dense uh, component packaging, there, there are two problems. There's one is access to it. Uh, as you stack it up uh, tighter and tighter, it gets harder and harder to get a hold of anything. And the other one is cooling it down. Now, I remember what a great breakthrough it was to have a transistor that didn't take any power after all those vacuum tubes. But suddenly, uh, we're back up to the point where a computer today takes as much power as the biggest vacuum tube computers did. And it's just that we put uh, so darn many of those little transistors that don't take any power in there. So cooling uh, is a very, very important uh, factor. Uh, and one of the things uh, that I'd like to talk around as I show you the slides of the physical structure uh, of my present computer is to talk a little about the cooling. Because it's something I think you can all relate to and, and it's a very challenging problem. Well, uh, let, let's see the first slide. Uh, this slide is a picture of uh, 
a circuit module. Now, this is six inches by eight inches. A couple of interesting things about these dimensions. Uh, obviously, they're, they're pretty conventional kind of uh, dimensions. Um, the uh, little squares you see, of course, are, are integrated circuits, and they're, they're other simple things. And uh, there's uh, there are 144 of them, uh, positions for them on each side of this module. There's two circuit boards, one on each side. But in between is a very heavy copper plate. I don't know if you can see how thick it is there, but it is a real hunk of copper. And the reason for that, of course, is to take the heat out. Uh, the uh, method of cooling uh, in this machine, as well as the controlled data 7000, 6000 machines, is to uh, get the heat away from the source uh, through metal conduction and then get it into Freon and pipe it away in the form of uh, Freon. So uh, in this machine we have a, a very heavy copper plate that uh, gets the heat away from the components uh, and into the uh, uh, next level of cooling, uh, which is uh, Freon flowing through aluminum bars. Now, uh, there is another uh, interesting aspect to this. Uh, let me just divert for a moment into the electrical field. Uh, you'll notice all those integrated circuits look alike, and sure enough, they are. Uh, there are, in the uh, machine I'm designing, only uh, three integrated circuit types. Uh, there's one uh, for the memory. It's a, a bipolar 1024 uh, memory chip. And there's one for registers, it's uh, just a 16 by one memory chip. And there's one for logic called a gate. And these are all gates. But there are only three chips types. And I don't believe anybody, in a, anybody else in this world is building a big computer with only three integrated circuit types. And I'd like to point out one of the merits of this, um, particularly in the logic area, because I think this is just very important. Uh, these, uh, these integrated circuits that, uh, that you see here uh, are simple gates in the sense that uh, they have uh, either four or five uh, inputs to them. There's two halves to the package. There's a four-wide gate and a five-wide gate. And uh, both uh, the normal and the complementary outputs uh, from the uh, gate are, uh, are brought out. Well, in our machine, uh, they, both of these outputs always go into a transmission line of the, of the right impedance and are terminated in their characteristic impedance. And so as uh, information goes through the gate, and uh, the gate switches back and forth, the dynamic loading on the power supply is perfectly balanced. That is, there is no dynamic component uh, appearing on power supply that drives this module because no matter what the information content, either one side or the other is conducting. Well, this may seem kind of trivial, but it is not at all trivial, because uh, with, uh, as the engineers say, edge times less than a nanosecond, which means that uh, these things are changing state uh, at a rate less than a nanosecond, standing waves develop in a plate as big as this six by eight inch plate, because after all, a nanosecond is less than the board width. And so if you don't have dynamic balance uh, in the uh, transmission systems and the signals, uh, there are all sorts of strange things happen in the ground structure of the computer. And most designers seem to ignore this problem and they get very complicated integrated circuit chips where they do many levels of logic inside. And as soon as you do more than one level of logic, there's no way in this world that you can have dynamic balance because you don't have both outputs of, of uh, each logical uh, level. So I think uh, that is, is one of the key points uh, in uh, favor of uh, simplicity in the electrical circuits. Let's have the next slide. Uh, this is, uh, is just uh, illustrating the, uh, the, the, the center uh, copper plate and uh, the inside and outside of the board. You see all the components are mounted on one side of the board and uh, essentially most of the far ones are on the other side. So a very simple package, nothing particularly clever about it. Next slide. 
Now, here we have something else again. It looks too big for one thing, and it just doesn't all get on the screen. But uh, this uh, illustrates how uh, the modules are stacked, are actually stacked in the computer frame uh, in columns which have 128 module positions. They're spaced four-tenths of an inch apart. Uh, uh, this is uh, important in, in the sense of density. So you actually, the, the components on one board just barely clear the components on the other, and there's no way uh, that I could find of putting them any closer together than they are here. Now, what you see between the columns and modules um, are aluminum bars. Uh, it's a very interesting story related to these aluminum bars. Here's where the real cooling problem occurs, of course. There's Freon flowing through those, and that cools the machine. And uh, this machine, as you'll see uh, in a later slide, is almost small enough so you can put your arms around it. It's uh, four feet in diameter, and yet it, it dissipates close to 100,000 watts. And so you've got to pump a lot of Freon through those aluminum bars. <laughs> now, it was kind of a shock here uh, when I started my little company because I thought, aha, uh -huh, I had just used those control data techniques uh, to cool. After all, uh, I've been using Freon now for 10 years, and so we'll just pump a little more Freon and everything will be just dandy. But it didn't turn out to be the case because um, uh, the density of uh, components went up, uh, went up enough here, and the heat generated was so great that it turns out the Freon technology that I knew from my previous company didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was we'd always use copper tubing for the uh, freon and aluminum extrusions. Kind of pinched the copper tubing between two pieces of aluminum, and that always seemed to do the job, and that was current technology. But there was a problem in that uh, when you do those things, uh, if any of you, and you, probably a lot of you know physics better than I, there are all sorts of surface barrier problems. And uh, the drop across, the, the thermal drop across those boundaries was a serious enough problem so we couldn't do the job. And so we concluded we had to cast our machine. We had to cast bars about five foot long, weighing several hundred pounds, with the aluminum inside so that we could get good thermal conductivity between the aluminum and the freon. And here was a, a surprising problem. Uh, nobody seemed to do that. Uh, <laughs> One of the problems was, of course, you couldn't use copper tubing because uh, when you pour the aluminum into the mold, the copper melts. So you can't do that. And uh, so we had to use stainless steel tubing inside the bars. And uh, oh my, there were, were still a lot of problems because uh, even if you use the stainless steel tubing and you, uh, you silver braze the various joints together, Still, when you pour that hot aluminum in, uh, the, the, uh, the stainless steel, of course, has a wholly different uh, coefficient of expansion than aluminum. And uh, those things got real long for just a moment. <laughs> and it was just very hard to make the aluminum cool down without breaking uh, the stainless steel uh, tubing. And what's even worse than that, uh, we thought, oh, well, what's a few bends or breaks here and there? It's all poured in aluminum anyway. But then another lesson, uh, aluminum's pretty porous. And uh, cast aluminum is porous enough so the freon will leak right through it. <laughs> and so uh, we, we made quite a few bars before we found it. <laughs> the freon kept leaking out right through that solid aluminum. Well, it took a year and a quarter um, of my own valuable money to... Uh, <laughs> To develop the technology for casting stainless steel uh, tubes for freon in aluminum. Uh, we've finally done that now, and I guess we've got a new technology which uh, we won't tell everybody exactly how to do right away. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think we have the first cast computer in the sense that uh, uh, we have 13 of these big, heavy uh, bars, and uh, we machine them with slots and slide our copper plates in and clamp them down tight. And sure enough, you can pump enough free answer there to cool 
and all those modules. Turns out to be 12 columns, 128 modules high, so about 1,500 modules in the machine. And uh, that's not really many compared to other computers. It's a rather small number. And uh, customer engineers are going to really like that because if you don't know what you're doing, the fewer modules you have, the better off you are. <laughs> Well, that's especially true uh, when, uh, as in really all, all other machines that I built, uh, this one too, uh, two-thirds of the machine is memory. And of course, it's pretty easy to find what's wrong in the memory section because it's all organized so neatly that you can find the, the bit position and the bank, and these are all arranged in nice columns and rows. So it only ends up to be 500 modules where you have to try real quick, and uh, you ought to be able to get it on the 250th on an average. <laughs> Let's have the next slide. Uh, here, here is one of our uh, young new engineers, and he is madly checking out our computer, and it gives you a bit of an idea for the dimensions. Uh, actually, he appears to be sitting on a chair, but that's not true. He is not sitting on a chair, he's sitting on our computer. And uh, the reason this happened is, is kind of interesting. Uh, it turns out that uh, all that power uh, that we're pumping out uh, in the Freon has to go in somehow, and so you have to have a power supply uh, that uh, is very substantial, not only in terms of power, but in terms of current. Because as most of you know, transistors use rather low voltages. It's just a whole pile of current. So uh, we, uh, we have something like 36,000 amperes of current we have to put in this machine at uh, just a few volts. And uh, one of the things about electricity is if you're going to put a lot of current uh, somewhere far away, you've got to have an awful lot of copper cross-section to get it there. And so you want to get it just as close as you can. Well, since the stacks are arranged in nice, just nice neat piles like that, we thought we ought to put a power supply right at the bottom of the stack. And so we did, and we figured out the dimensions, and it turned out uh, to be about 20 inches high and about uh, oh, 30 inches deep. And so uh, we have um, uh, sort of a, a cushion uh, on top of it, and around the uh, base of the computer, uh, it looks sort of like uh, a lobby. Uh, <laughs> uh, the sort of thing you'd find in a lobby, you know, you can, uh, you can sit on the power supplies. And it's very convenient, you see, the customer engineer can just pull up his scope and sit down on the power supply and hook it up, and that way we don't have all these chairs rattling around that keep bumping into the computer and scratching it, you know? <laughs> it, it's just a great saving. Oh, let's, let's see the next slide. Uh, there we are. Uh, this is uh, taken apart a bit. It's not focused too well either. I wonder what went wrong there. Uh, would you see if you could tune that just a little so you can see the bottom there? Oh, uh, yes, that's better. Uh, the real purpose of this slide is, is first of all, to show you uh, the vertical dimensions. Now, th this is a little less than six foot tall altogether. It's just above eye level, so you can't see the dust on the top. <laughs> but uh, down in the bottom, you see uh, how impressive those power supplies look. Look at all that copper and rectifiers and things down there. Uh, those, uh, those cushions that sit on top of that cover really are. Uh, a marvelous engineering job. I could say that because I didn't have anything to do with that. But those uh, power supplies uh, are all cooled with Freon, too. You see a bunch of plumbing and valves and things down there. Uh, the Freon uh, flows around through, uh, through those plates uh, which hold the transformers and rectifiers and cool the whole operation. Not only that, but it turns out that the the bus that uh, delivers the power up to the modules, uh, even though it's uh, about a square inch in cross-section, has to be cooled with Freon as well. So the whole darn frame, uh, which is mostly cast, is Freon cooled throughout, all the way from the base up to the top. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, here we see uh, an early mock-up, which is still an honest one. Uh, this is how the computer looks when it's done. And uh, you notice uh, <clears> that there seems to be a hole in it there. Um, that uh, the top part uh, is about, uh, well, I guess it's 39 inches in diameter. And 
the wiring uh, is the wiring to interconnect the modules is on the inside, which is pretty darn small. In fact, we, we have to choose our assembler girls rather carefully. Uh, it's, uh, it's a form of uh, discrimination, which uh, I don't believe is against the law. Uh, we choose only slender ones. <laughs> And uh, they, they have to uh, work in there for uh, some period of time, uh, like six months. <laughs> uh, in order to hook up all those wires uh, in that small space, uh, so uh, this is one of the big factors in how long it takes us to build a computer. It, it takes us six months to do that part, and then six months to check it out and make the corrections. So it takes about a year. Anyway, uh, the inside of that, uh, is uh, where the wiring is, and as, as you can probably see and imagine there, um, the inside is a good deal smaller than the outside. And in fact, there aren't any wires in the machine that are longer than three feet. And, and that's pretty dramatic compared to uh, the last machine, really the 7600, which had wires about 15 feet long. So uh, there, there is a factor of five here on uh, the length of the wires involved. And that's pretty darn important if you expect to get a factor of five in speed. You can't just do it in one area, you've got to do it in every area, or else you don't get your factor of five. And so although it's very hard work, and those little girls say an awful lot of bad things when they're working inside there, it, it is really important. And I keep telling them how important that is. I think there's one more slide. I was a slightly different angle. Uh, uh, there, there was one point here I wanted to stress. Now, I, I kind of like uh, the aesthetics of computers. So this, uh, I don't know if you can see it too well here, but those vertical panels are, um, are fiberglass, and we have uh, four very, sh uh, very uh, subtle tints of um, browns and greens and reds. And since there are 12 of them, it comes out even. There are three of each. And I've had an awful lot of trouble about the cushions. Uh, I think it should be black. I think black is quality. <laughs> but there are people that want plaids and reds and greens. <laughs> but as long as I'm president, we're going to have black cushions. <laughs> I think that's all the uh, slides. Uh, let me uh, just say uh, a few words uh, about what I think is happening here uh, in terms of uh, characteristics of the computer and where we're going. Uh, this machine represents uh, my first attempt uh, at vector uh, implementation in hardware. Uh, of course, we didn't call our earlier machines scalar machines, which is calling them that now. But they were scalar machines in the sense that uh, an instruction took a single, single operand, a single number, did something to it, and went on and took the next number. Well, I'm certainly not inventing vector machines. Uh, there are uh, several kinds. There are three kinds I know of existing today. Uh, they are represented by ILIAC-4, uh, STAR machine, and the TI machine. And those three were all pioneering machines, and they were all started about the same time, the mid-60s. And uh, each had its merits, and each had its problems. But uh, if we look at uh, the, the STAR machine and the TI machine, there, there's a lot in common between those two, in the sense that they involved uh, uh, taking organized streams of operands out of memory instead of one at a time, and streaming them through some mathematical process and putting the result back in memory. And, and that, that really is a, a pretty significant uh, departure from a scalar machine. And sure enough, it has a lot of merit. Uh, one of the problems, of course, of being a pioneer is you always make mistakes. And I never, never want to be a pioneer. Uh, it's always best to come second. Uh, when you can look at all the mistakes that the pioneers made, uh, as if, one, if you want to make money, you want to do this. <laughs> uh, uh, so you have to come around second and, and see what other people have done wrong, uh, and then take advantage of it, you see, because by that time the secret's out, and uh, so you can do a better job. Well, uh, I, this is what uh, I'm up to. And uh, the, the uh, star machine, uh, 
and the TI machine, uh, with some variations, uh, are implementations of very, be very basic vector thinking. And, of course, one of the problems is that uh, if you're streaming data from a relatively slow memory, as, as each has uh, through uh, some computational device and back again, it takes a long time to get the stream started up and stopped again. And so you have to organize things into very long streams. Well, that seems reasonable at first, um, but when we get down into the nitty gritties of real practical programs, uh, uh, do loops and Fortran and such things, uh, you find these little numbers like three and five and nine, and they just uh, don't turn out to be a thousand very easy. And, and so uh, one of the things uh, which I am doing uh, in, uh, in this uh, gray machine is to uh, use uh, the intermediate registers that I mentioned earlier in the same sense for vectors as for scalars. That is, separate uh, the source uh, and destination of the operands uh, for doing your mathematical functions from the memory. And, and so uh, this machine has eight vector registers, just like it has eight scalar registers. And they have a segment of a vector, namely, they have provision of up to 64 elements, which is long enough to cover the startup and stopping times nicely. And so the philosophy uh, uh, represented in the six and 7,000 machines of isolating the, uh, the computational portion from the memory uh, is being carried over into the vector area with exactly the same thinking involved. And so it's possible uh, then to um, do uh, multiple vector operations at the same time from one vector register to another. You can be doing this three, four, five times uh, all concurrently. Uh, which is quite a step then from uh, the, the earlier uh, machines, which just assumed that there would be one stream from the memory and one stream back, or two streams from the memory and one stream back again. And uh, this, I hope, will be a significant step in uh, making programming uh, in vector mode easier. So uh, where do we go from this point? Well. Uh, I can see several things to do next, and of course I have to get busy now because I almost finished this machine, got to get going on the next one. And uh, there are two ways uh, of going, uh, at least two. Uh, one of them is parallel processing. Now, uh, I had sort of an interesting experience in this area at Control Lola just before I left. I spent two years working on a program which was the 8600 program. And that was very interesting in the sense that it was an attempt to uh, put four processors on one memory in a very intimate way and have those four processors all work on the same program at the same time. Now, uh, that's quite a challenge uh, in the software area, maybe too big a challenge for right now, uh, but it had a lot of interesting a aspects. And, uh, uh, Reentrant code it gets very much involved with that, as you can imagine. And, and so there, there were a lot of interesting things involved there that I'd like to explore again. Uh, it so happens that that particular program was aborted for reasons that weren't all technical. The company decided to go in the service business, but uh, that, uh, that nevertheless is a very valid way to proceed uh, in the future. And so uh, one thing that I can see uh, as a very real possibility uh, for going on beyond the uh, current step of, of having a monoprocessor with vector capability, which is what I've been showing you here, is to have a multiprocessor with vector capability. And there are many variations on that uh, in that the vector structure is somewhat separate uh, uh, from the uh, scalar and uh, it appears uh, that the uh, support functions, the housekeeping that you do in programming a vector machine is relatively uh, short compared to the vector streaming time. So you have a lot of time left over to do your various index indexing uh, operations and counting and such. And so perhaps uh, several vector mechanisms can be supported still in a monoprocessor mode by providing, say, four vector uh, structures uh, with a single program supporting them. And the other possibility is um, simply to increase bandwidth. Now, in the machine that uh, 
uh, we're finishing now, uh, we have uh, a word of a vector, an element of a vector, moving each clock period of 12 nanoseconds. And of course, it's quite possible to do many more than that. Uh, two, four, eight, however wide a bandwidth you want and in increase the computing speed in a vector mode that way. And so uh, both of those possibilities uh, exist for the immediate future. And I really can't see any, any real plateauing occurring as far as technology is concerned. I really believe, uh, first of all, that uh, the machine uh, that we're finishing now will be about five times as fast as, as the 7600 was doing the same mix of programs and that a machine can be designed uh, in the same kind of time frame uh, that will be five times fast again uh, with respect to the one that I'm doing now. So I really don't see any, uh, any real uh, plateau here that is going to uh, require some basic uh, new thinking, not yet at least. And I, I figure that uh, uh, my uh, my career will come out about right, so that uh, <laughs> as I run out of ideas in this area, I'll, I'll be approaching uh, retirement uh, at just the right rate, and uh, about three or four more generations should come out just right. So uh, I, I see, uh, let's say, uh, at least three more steps in, in that area, in which um, a single, really a single computing facility doing uh, numerical computation can every, uh, let's say, four years uh, produce uh, a factor of four in uh, computing speed. And I, I pretty much uh, believe that. Now, um, I uh, wonder if questions uh, are appropriate now. Um, I see I haven't quite used my hour. I have five minutes left. But, uh, I would entertain a question to uh, continue. <coughs> yes? How are you going to cool all the old processor versions? Well, um, you have to pump Freon faster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there is, of course, uh, a problem there. I actually, the accessibility to the components probably is the more critical. Uh, Integrated circuits, of course, can be made very, very small, uh, but uh, getting the heat out of the chip is, is not so easy. Uh, and I don't know how right at the moment to get around this problem of the simple gate that I'm describing. If you don't have a dynamically balanced uh, electrical circuit as, as the basic element that you use for computing, uh, then uh, there are these horrendous problems of uh, generating waves in the ground planes. And uh, uh, unless, uh, unless some clever solution that I don't now see comes up, I would stick with simple gates that are just smaller, which, you know, they could be made a lot smaller. We're using uh, a package called a flat pack, which is not very popular, but is a whole lot smaller than the dual inline package that's most common. Well, a flat pack is still a huge thing when you look inside it. There's just this little dot of a chip in the middle of it. And, and so I suppose, heaven forbid, I'll have to pay somebody an exorbitant research, <laughs> a research fee to develop a very, very small package in order to get it another factor of five, let's say, on physical dimensions. But uh, there's no reason why it can't be done. There's no physical reason why it can't be done. A simple gate could be made in just a millimeter square package. Yes. Is this uh, machine compatible with the 7600? Uh, not in the sense I think you mean it, in that the instruction set is the same. Uh, it's, it's very compatible in the sense that the philosophy of programming it is the same. Uh, there's sort of a, a 7600 buried inside of this in the sense that the scalar portion has virtually a one-for-one -one relationship on the instruction set. So uh, the same kinds of computations can be done in a scalar mode the same way. And the vector part is, is simply uh, added on. Uh, actually, uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, the, the 7600 was a 60-bit uh, machine, 
as was the 6600. And it's kind of interesting how I picked that number. Uh, I didn't. Um, uh, I designed that machine in 1960. And you know, <laughs> uh, I see you already know the answer. <laughs> I looked around me and I thought, well, let's see, uh, who's got the biggest machine around? It's Lark. And uh, Lark had a 60-bit word, and I thought, well, gee, that must be the way to go. Uh, and, and so I uh, picked 60 bits on the basis of Lark. Well, it seems kind of dumb now. But, you know, uh, uh, anyway, uh, in, uh, obviously today that's not the most popular word size. Uh, you're supposed to have power two now. And so uh, this machine has a 64-bit word. And so the, uh, the instructions, uh, the parcels, the four parcels in 64-bit word picked up one bit. And so they were 16 bits long instead of 15. Well, I still like octal. I don't want any of this hexadecimal business. And so, uh, <laughs> and so what to do with that extra bit? Well, uh, this was the, the secret that allowed us to put in this vector capability, because you've got to have one set for scale and one set for vector, so the upper bit you see gives you twice as many instructions. That well, works out just fine. Any comments on future Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's, uh, they don't seem to be keeping up. Uh, <laughs> I will, uh, I had a discussion just a couple of days ago with uh, one of the uh, semiconductor uh, people that's across the bay here, and uh, he was telling me all the wonderful things they're doing and how um, dynamic semiconductors are going to fill this gap that we've been trying to fill for a little so many years, and maybe he's right. We sure need it. Uh, I don't know about bubbles either. Huh? I don't know where the bubbles are going. but. Uh, there's, there needs, there is a real need there for something that we don't have and haven't had for a long time. And I really don't know any more about that than you do. I, I just read what I hear, and then I look a year later, and it's altogether a different story. So uh, I don't know what to make of that. It's certainly a problem area, but it's not one that I'm going to try to solve. Got enough of a challenge with my little box. Yeah. Well, we seem to have a leaning towards one's complement arithmetic. Why one's rather than two? Well, uh, some of us are slow learners. Uh, <laughs> this machine happens to be two's complement. <laughs> uh, there was a sort of an elegance about one's complement that I like personally, but that was just because that's what I was taught, I suppose. Uh, that dates all the way back, you know, to, I guess, Whirlwind uh, at MIT. Um, anyway, it's pretty old, and that's when I was taught when I left school, and I just forget those things real slowly, but uh, the, uh, the current machine is to its complement, and the uh, floating point format is sign and magnitude, which I think is aesthetically the nicest. Um, I thought for a while that one's complement was faster in terms of uh, execution speeds in, uh, in functional units, because, you know, you could just flop the bits over and got the negative, and that was pretty neat. But it turns out that it isn't all that significant, and uh, so, like I say, I'm a slow learner, but I've figured out how to do it now, and I think the, I think the two's complement is okay. <laughs> Anyway, you got to learn a few new things as you go along, so, uh, I mean, heck, trying to be broad-minded. Yeah? What would you uh, say your favorite algorithmic advances on this machine work? Have algorithmic advances? Do you have any Oh, no, those things are all too complicated for me. Uh, the, uh, the problem, if you ignore, uh, Cost. Now, paging is a way of keeping cost down, basically. If you ignore that, then what you want is the biggest memory you can possibly build as fast as you can build it. And so, uh, paging is a little inconsistent with that. And besides that, there are a whole bunch of uh, complicated things that go on in paging that uh, sort of frighten me. So, uh, I'm, I'm not ready for that yet. There's only one level of memory in this machine. It's a million 64-bit words, and it's 48 nanosecond cycle time. <laughs>
Implications are all right. Uh, I guess I'm just so hung up on simplicity that, that most of these good things uh, that you're talking about uh, seem to me to inevitably involve compromises in speed somewhere along the line. And I'm probably being too dogmatic about them, but uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, it seems to me that you do sacrifice something on each of those points in terms of speed. Uh, I think the, the very simplest kinds of uh, storage mechanisms uh, have got to be the fastest. For, for total food Yeah, I think so. I realize that there are valid arguments for that, but, but I, I'm still hung up on that philosophy. Yes, sir? Can you say something about the I.O. characteristics? Yes, uh, this machine uh, has 12 I.O. channels, and, and they're full duplexed, uh, and they're very much like the 7600 channels, uh, same identical philosophy. Uh, the only uh, real difference here is, as you know, the 7600 had a memory hierarchy, so you had to go through the small core memory to get to the large core memory buffers. And here, uh, with the single fast large memory, uh, it's uh, more back to the 6600 in that you have wide open fields, which can either be uh, in uh, the uh, area of the program code or not, as you see fit. It can either be secure or not secure. Uh, and so it's a very simple kind of an I.O. channel with, uh, with two registers running and a limit uh, register, and uh, the same kinds of control communications as a 7000 channel. Talk a little bit about where speed is going to go in the future. What about memory sizes? Is that going to be Well, um, well uh, the semiconductor people are really doing quite good things. I guess they always have, but I've been more impressed in the last few years than earlier. Uh, uh, we have a, a one million word memory here, which is, uh, which is, as I say, 48 nanoseconds, which is as about as fast as you can get bipolar chips now. And these are 1,000 by 24 by 1 bit chips. And uh, the, uh, the prospect uh, for a 4096 chip of the same power and same speed uh, in two years hence uh, looks quite good. So um, for, the, for the next machine, let's, let's suppose a machine to be delivered uh, four or five years from now, it looks to me like with a factor of four or five computational speed improvement, factor four or five memory size improvement can be made at the same cost. So technology in that area, I think, is keeping up nicely. I wish I could say the same for I.O. Maybe I.O. will come, come alive here, but it's certainly been lagging the last decade. Yes, sir? Well, twice as much memory uh, in the sense of uh, comparing the large core memory, you see, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, this very fast memory. And that, uh, that comparison is uh, quite a speed difference, you see. Here we're comparing uh, 48 nanoseconds with a microsecond and three quarters or, or some such number. It's a great big number. Uh, the question might better be directed as to uh, if you want a memory hierarchy like the 7600, what size should it be and uh, what should it be made out of? And it should be external to this particular box because what you'd like to have would be uh, more like 10 million words or more. And so it's too big to fit in a little box. And what I'm hoping is that uh, some laser memory or bubble memory or semiconductor or something or other memory uh, will be available uh, for this machine as that second level. Uh, we need it. We need it uh, very badly. <coughs> yes, it does. Uh, uh, we can uh, we can move. Uh, we're looking at the I/O in total and uh, the interface to the memory. 
can move a 64-bit word every 12 nanoseconds, assuming it doesn't interfere with one of the references uh, of the CPU. So that, that's, that's a whole lot of bits uh, in a microsecond, and I think would easily support uh, a second-level memory. Yeah. What implications uh, do these fast machines have for operating systems? Are operating systems going to get more sophisticated, or are you going to be able to be more brute force and dumber? Well, uh, well, I like simple operating systems, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'm sure they're not going to get simpler, uh, but uh, I, I think it's, it's somewhat independent. Uh, Surely, um, a, uh, an operating system uh, with the same kinds of complexities uh, will uh, work on a faster machine and, and, and give you the same kinds of ratios of, uh, of throughput. Uh, so uh, a complicated operating system, which we always evolve over a period of years, is simply a matter of providing greater facility, which uh, most everybody wants. I think it's kind of independent of machine speed. Uh, that's a matter of, of features rather than, than speed per se. Uh, again, I don't really feel qualified to say all that much. I, I don't understand why we have as complicated operating systems as we do. It's just, it kind of boggles my mind, and I, I, don't, I don't quite understand it. It's, on my field. Yeah. What type of wire connections do you use on your module? Oh, um, that is interesting because it, it is a bit of a departure. Um, I think uh, I went through four generations of machines using taper pins and a high pressure trifurcated contact for the pin. It was a very reliable thing and uh, we were always very happy with it. Uh, there was, uh, starting in the early 60s and really coming of age in the latter part of the 60s, uh, a new connector, uh, which uh, has uh, the male portion of the connector with the spring.